Okay, very good. So uh, for those of you who don't know what Open Research Institute is, it's a 501c3. It's operated as a research institute. Uh, we have a website, which is on the slide, openresearch.institute. We celebrated our first anniversary of full operation in uh, March of 2020. We have a diverse board of directors. 60% of us are underrepresented or minority. All work is published as it is created. Our default is GPL 3.0 and the CERN open hardware license. If we need to use another license for work, then, then we do, but those are the, the defaults. We do amateur radio, space and terrestrial work. We have been active in the open cars movement. We do bacteriophage, open source research and development. We have participated in some medical device work and we do regulatory and legal work. We have an active outreach participation, presentation and documentation history. We've presented on three continents over the past couple of years and have been at all sorts of major uh, events. Some of you have, have seen us there or participated or presented. In terms of our affiliation, we are an affiliate member of the Open Source uh, Initiative. We're an AMSAT member society. We have letters of intent and commitment with ARES, ARX, JAMSAT, and more. We're the logistics sponsor for GNU Radio Project 2020, uh, 2021 and have been volunteering there for a while and, and more. Uh, we support projects like uh, Applied Ion Systems and anybody doing open source work that uh, needs some help. Open Research Institute is intended to be an umbrella organization, meaning that uh, the projects are the, the point. Uh, we do not sell memberships. We are uh, open to any open source project. And I have some really good news. So we have met our phase one funding goal. This was a goal of $50,000 to start phase one work uh, documented on the website and in various grant proposals. This is a quick breakdown of where the money comes from. The blue is from our trans-ionospheric campaign. And a lot of that uh, was uh, for badge work, for conference badge work. Um, and also some individual donations. The orange, the darker orange, is uh, what the money that's been donated that is earmarked specifically for ground station work. The gray is a recent grant of $3,000 from AWRL Foundation. That's their maximum. And they are also helping with two other uh, grants. So we continue the fundraising, uh, even though the goal has been met, we're, we're not gonna stop work on that. Um, but AWRL has been been quite remarkable here in helping us find additional uh, fundraising sources. And today, the final vote from Yasme Foundation came in, and we will get $30,000 from Yasme Foundation for phase one funding. This is extremely good news. So I've, I've broken down the numbers, uh, exactly how much came from where, and where do we go from here? Well, the $46,000 is immediately available for microwave digital space and terrestrial payload work and the 4,800, uh, we can move forward on ground station work. Our phase two goal uh, for, for the payload work is $400,000. That will uh, work well and that is continuing and, and ongoing. And I'm reasonably optimistic that if we stick the landing on phase one technical goals, that we will be able to achieve this ambitious fundraising goal of 400,000. So what is all this money going to be used for? Um, well, we've been very active uh, on our own publishing work and making sure that people know uh, what we do and all the related projects, uh, everything from Theseus cores to AIS work. But our, our main customer, so to speak, is AREX, uh, Amateur Radio Exploration. This is a project from ARIS, Amateur Radio and the International Space Station. And we are doing their system architecture work. Uh, me and Dr. Christopher Bridges are the system architects for it. And we have been regularly meeting for many weeks and I've been active on uh, Eric's project since February. So here is, I'm just gonna walk through uh, the technical side, uh, recent updates that, that we have presented the Eric's, uh, essentially their board. So recently we've added a payload uh, interface for dealing with the camera. That was a request from Frank Bauer. Um, we've looked at hardware state tables and we've reviewed it several times. There's some reliability trade document studies that have been submitted and edited. Uh, we've looked at digital state tables and interfaces and uh, all sorts of good stuff. 
at the high level, this is what uh, this phase one work that we are talking about, the fundraising goals uh, we're, we're aimed towards. This is a, a very high level block diagram of, of what all of that is going towards. None of this is um, ambitious or risky, uh, as ambitious and risky um, as, it, as it can kind of get. Putting an FPGA in space, some people consider it is very risky, but this is being done by people that have, have done this before. The level of redundancy and care that's going into this design is very high. So I just want to warn people, there's a huge diversity of opinions on how risky the design is. Uh, we're not doing anything um, that that hasn't that isn't right up the middle in terms of, of architecture. So that's the block diagram. There's four different sections or four boards. We call them boards. There's the FPGA processor board. There's a TTNC transceiver board, a C-band receiver board, and an X-band transmitter board. So the frequencies that we are using, uh, 5 gigahertz uplink and 10 gigahertz downlink, DVB-S2, S2X. If you've been following the projects for phase four ground and phase four space, all of this will sound very familiar. All of this work is very compatible with the work that we have already done and donated. And a lot of that work that's been done and donated is being actively used by Eric. So this, um, this uh, collaboration moving forward will help both ARIS, AMSAT, ERICS, and ORI, and anybody else that wants to participate. Okay, so when you look at the block diagram, this is just a call out of the different types of things. Your FPGA processor board can be an SDR. It can be an Astro SDR. It could be a Pluto. It could be a USRP. It could be something custom. What we want is for that to be something that can be replaced, that can be modular, and that the entire system architecture can tolerate uh, not just a different, a completely different FPGA processor board, but losing it entirely and still being able to operate as a, a microwave transponder. So that's a requirement of this of the architecture. Here's the tricky parts that can cause losses. We have two, two switches and we have a splitter. Here's what we have in green or you know, what's available now still needs to be integrated, but what we've been able to accomplish so far and you know, across various organizations, not just ORI. The yellow or tan is from other missions that uh, Chris Bridges and I know about. And the red is what we consider to be the highest risk. So the, you can see that over on the right, the antenna is uh, what we consider to be the highest risk. This is aimed at Lunar Gateway. Um, the Gateway project is a, a very eccentric orbit around the moon. And from the perspective of both Gateway and, uh, and the Earth, this is, a, a, it is an unusual orbit. And the entire station, Gateway station, may move in, um, in remarkable ways in order to deal with radiation pressure and things like that, which means you're dealing with essentially an omnidirectional challenge from the perspective of Gateway. So there's lots of antenna design and RF design that still needs to happen. What we're doing right now is modeling the orbit and talking with uh, as many people at NASA and Gateway people as possible to try to prepare for, um, for what the orbit and what the link budget will really be. All right, this is just pointing out the switches. Uh, this, this image uh, is, is used in the document to introduce the whole idea of the hardware states or RF switch states. So two switches, four hardware states. You have a transponder mode, a digital mode, a transponder plus the UHF telemetry, and a digital mode plus UHF telemetry. So those are the ways that the payload can operate. What we do is, or in, during this process, uh, we moved into looking at what the interfaces were. Um, and we dug into that and decided to, um, to do a few things. We would be collecting te telemetry. We'd be running finite state machines to manage the switches. Uh, we have to have a push to talk GPO line for safety and for regulatory. You know, So if you've done any of this work, all of this should look familiar. The SDR UART is where we will operate a, a command line in order to uh, provide some, some interesting functionality for the SDR. What we want it to do is to be used by um, operators and for education and for experimentation and for just communications. But 
if it's not being used or if it needs to be tested, then we have um, text-based control and the SDR will go through all sorts of test modes. So somebody on the ground um, can tune in and test their ground station completely, um, you know, all sorts of different modulations and coatings. And also we need to be able to uh, update the, uh, the FPGAs in the SDR. This is where that will happen. And also um, for failure, I talked about being failure tolerant so that the SDR can, can drop out, can be, uh, can literally be cut out of the circuit. There's a, the way that that's detected is through heartbeats. So there's a software and a hardware heartbeat that the FPGA board will produce. And these, when these heartbeats are um, not heard, uh, then there's a finite state machine that will manage the attempts to reset. After some amount of time and some amount of trials, it's decided that the that the board is gone. Then the switches are switched in a particular way, and it will be a transponder. So the goal here was to make it uh, failure tolerant. We do not want this to be a uh, a glass cannon or to be uh, so advanced and complex that um, that a failure in, in the, somewhere in the digital board would make the entire uh, would render the entire mission moot. We started digging into interfaces. We decided that a table or a description wasn't really doing it for us. So over the past week, we drew everything down. And right now, this is our interface uh, diagram. And it goes out for review uh, next week at the Eric meeting. We've started to identify and figure out how to uh, deal with fault detection, and isolation and recovery. So we are drawing from um, e both ESA and NASA missions of this type, and, um, and we will be presenting this uh, next Thursday. From the user point of view, there is a variety of, of modes that are available. The, the sort of digital transponder plus telemetry plus access control down at the bottom is what uh, ORI and Base for Ground has been writing about for uh, the past four years. And that's what we've been working to enable. But you see that there is uh, a variety of modes here. So what we want to do is want to, to divide up the user uh, access or user point of view and make absolutely sure that we know which functions and which capabilities uh, can be modular so that it goes all the way from essentially a, a transponder uh, up to a digital transponder and then through digital transponder plus telemetry which starts to allow you to have these feedback loops and to improve your bandwidth and to, to do adaptive coding and modulation all the way up to all of that plus access control and the payloads so besides just all the communications stuff um, that we are doing that we've been doing for for a while and focusing a lot of our publishing and attention on now we're being asked through through eris and erex to uh, to start to design in other support such as uh, payload and uh, the first real uh, request from from nasa and from erex has been for a camera option so that is the type of work that a, a number of volunteers are are beginning to do okay so that's uh, a one aspect of the work that we have been doing. I wanted to share it uh, with all of you um, at, because uh, you know, I think that, that while this work is going into a document that is being updated regularly, uh, it's, it's not quite at the point where it's published. So I, I wanted to show how all of the different things I've been working on are actually contributing towards uh, the collaborative work with, with ARIS and ARIX. Okay, so I'll turn this off. And it is now time for your questions. So this is open for, for Q&A and general discussion and uh, uh, comments, suggestions, and questions. Can you put the, uh, that, the first block diagram up again? <clears throat> I believe I can. I'm going to attempt to do this again. The overall block diagram, system block diagram. This one. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. And also, I will I will send out uh, the current set of slides. This the set. Uh, so so you you will have a I'll have a copy of it. So 
looks like everything uh, I'm kind of focused on the FPGA since that's my area of uh, interest. Yes. Um, the question you have the, uh, the transceiver board talking directly to the ROM and the RAM. So that's you right. have like dual port memories or how are you going to do that? The, the answer is it depends because this is a system architecture approach. So the particular FPGA that's implemented may be the one that we've been talking about for ORI uh, 6U payload, or it could be uh, something off the shelf, or it could be a Rincon uh, Astro SDR. That, that is up to the, but that's an awful lot of work that needs to happen over the next month. If, if yeah. Addressing, in other words, that's an implementation decision. But in, in general, we, we expect this sort of architecture based on uh, the missions from the ESA that Dr. Bridges is involved with. Okay. I'm just looking at uh, all the lines that cross the dotted line mm -hmm. and thinking, well, okay, now what interface is that? So the ADC and the DAC, that's easy. It's analog. The GPIO, that's easy. Yes. The well, yeah, it is. And then this is this is another view of that. So this is the uh, or beginning of the, of the interface capture. So it, it's good to also look at this. Here, I'll go back to the other one. Okay. It's just that, that I, you know, when I see two lines coming into memories, it makes mm -hmm. me know how it's actually going to be done. So I know maybe too deep of a dive here, but. Well, no, it, it's, a, it's a, a timely and good question. We've spent a couple of hours working on uh, how to how to talk to memory and what sorts of things you need yeah. to do for memory and orbit. And the the interesting thing so far uh, in in discussions about like radiation concerns for for the moon is that it apparently isn't that bad, which I didn't know because as a uh, ground pounder. Uh, and ground station person, radiation, the only real radiation that I have to worry about is the radiation I cause, uh, like under Bulletin 65, you know, to, to warn people of, of the, that they've exceeded radiation limits. In other words, don't stand in front of a dish at certain microwave frequencies <laughs> above certain powers. So my assumption is that everything in space is horrible and awful. And it, it actually isn't entirely true. There's, there's a huge difference in the amount of radiation that you suffer depending on what orbit you're in and the lunar uh, sort of environment really isn't that bad. Mm. Having said that, it's still bad enough to where you need to do all of the triple redundancy stuff. Like yeah. Well, the so RAM say is triple redundant and then everything has, there's a, a series of techniques for FPGA that, that make it uh, as reliable as possible. And even having said all of that and even, even, you know, laying down our requirements. Like I said, if this board dies for any reason, then the system fails over to an analog transponder. Yeah. But like, so what I would do is I would put the RAM and the ROM off the FPGA and the control interface there through the FPGA, but that may be undesirable because that makes the FPGA, if the FPGA goes away, you may still be able to talk to the RAM and ROM, but if the RAM is only used to steer the FPGA, then you would yeah care what it does if the FPGA dies it doesn't make any difference so yes so then you would route the data through the FPGA and that would be pretty easy yes yeah there's there's more than one way to skin a cat and thing, what, you know thing I just I've been looking at different FPGA alternates for the tangerine project for, for tapper because I'm getting some pricing of the max tens one thing I found is if you use a uh, a uh, Cyclone 10 FPGA, they have a very interesting approach to SEUs and, uh, and radiation. And so rather than like the, the, um, the flash-based ones, the, uh, which is the microchip ones, well, they're microchip now. But anyway, but rather than the flash-based ones, which are sort of inherently immune, they're, they're more immune, shall we say. Yeah. What this does is this constantly scans the SRAM configuration while the chip is running and detects any anomalies. So it can mm -hmm. do the flash. And if it sees an anomaly, it can flag you. And I haven't quite figured out exactly what it does when it finds an error. Yeah. But it's going to give you the option to reload. Yeah, that's that's that comes up in the in in the document for um, for system architecture because you're you've you've hit upon something um, 
that is very important. Detection of an error is, is great, but correction is what you have to have. Mm -hmm. And as you know, um, and as most people listening may, may either know or intuitively know, uh, detection is, is, is great. It's better than not detecting an error and wandering off into the weeds. But detecting an error, you're, you're, you, know, you need to be able to correct it too. And our abilities, mathematical abilities to detect errors are much greater than our ability to correct them. So if you insist upon error correction and not just detection, then you have to spend more time, effort, and energy in the coding in order to achieve that higher uh, bar. So in, in FDA, all, of, yeah. all of this sort of stuff though for, for Eric's is correction. We, we simply in, aren't going to stop with detection. In the FPGA, correction is just reloading the image. So you, all you have to do is make sure that your flash is robust enough that that never gets corrupted. That's one part of the puzzle, and that's a necessary part. Yeah, because the RAM is certainly much more susceptible to being bumped than the flash is. Yeah, yeah. So if you can detect it, then and you have an original image that you can reload. So the worst that happens is you get an interruption in service for the time it takes to reload it. Yeah, there's some techniques that that allow us yeah. to that that is one way to do it, and and that is the fallback if the um, if the underlays don't work. Well, or it's just interesting that the, that the FPGA does this automatically, this this detection, and it's the first yes. one that actually does that in real time while you're running, it's checking the image, mm -hmm. to make sure that it, nothing is has corrupted it, which right. that's pretty good for a, a nice feature yeah. that. It's very good. I mean, that's that's why we pick FPGAs. Um, you know, and as you know, the work that ORI does is it, we do FPGA work and we do general processor work and we also do uh, graphical processing unit approaches. And you can see the success with graphical processing units with essentially the like the the dragon being uh, run with uh, NVIDIA, you know, boards. So mm -hmm. we have a, such a, a wonderful tool chest uh, in front of us and remarkable opportunities now to develop uh, very advanced and very resilient code, not just on FPGAs and not just with ASICs, uh, but also with GPUs and general processors. So, the, and traditionally, FPGA design has been remarkably difficult for um, anybody outside of a, of a, you know, a company to do based on the, the tool chains and the, and the parts themselves being, being so expensive. I can't say that things are better, but things are changing and becoming um, more open. Uh, there's been some big steps forward here from, from Xilinx uh, and from the open source community and from the open hardware community. So we're contributing and working with and collaborating with um, a lot of open source uh, projects that are making a huge amount of headway in FPGAs. Now, having said that, there is no real candidate for an open source FPGA for uh, for space yet that I know of, but we are constantly looking for that and advocating for that to organizations like like NASA and ARIS and ARIX, uh, you know anybody that that will that we can partner with or or, or listen that will listen to us uh, in any way. So it's still um, big iron parts. It's still proprietary a lot of proprietary tool chains. Um, this is an opportunity on ARIX to, to start using uh, open source code. It might still be on what is essentially considered proprietary parts, but if this goes forward and our code is used, it will be uh, one of the first big incursions of open source into, into spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Not the first, but with uh, Libraspace uh, and Upsat, but this is, this is good, advanced, solid, uh, very, uh, you know, world-class code that that will fly if if all of this comes uh, comes about, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't. Can you elaborate a little on the, the what the TT and C bus is? What I mean, more, in more detail, because I you should get that going into the FPGA too. Yeah, I, yeah, I wish I could. Or bus, or? There may be somebody on the call that knows more about space buses and TT and C stuff than I do. Um, my my area of expertise for this architecture is uh, the, for the SDR and and for the C band and X band and Dr. Chris Bridges is the expert for the TTNC. I know that having a dual bus is really super important, and uh, this is where 
the TTNC is where all the magic will happen. So this is essentially the flight, flight computing. And uh, this is where it, if we've talked about finite state machines. There's a number of them that are involved. A finite state machine, like its name says, is a set of uh, a closed set, a, a set, a finite set of states, of, of conditions of operation. And you move from one state to another based on either a, an input or something that you sense. So these finite state machines essentially run in software. There are finite state machines that will be running on the FPGA processor board, but the probably more important ones, the finite state machines, run on the RadHard TTNC. So not my area of expertise because it is uh, flight and space. Um, but I was just the, curious whether it was a, like a big wide parallel bus or whether it's a serial bus or at, at, the, at this level, we do not tell you what the bus width is. Those discussions are beginning, and we expect okay. them to continue and um, maybe not be finalized, but we're anticipating a uh, preliminary design review in late June. So by June 25th, a lot of the recommendations for bus widths and types uh, and the yeah. names of all the GPIOs and the names of all the signals, which we, okay. we have started, that, that, will, that will be published and, and reviewed and, and uh, everyone will see it by the so, so basically you're just showing your control path there and that that's to be de defined. Yes, this, this high level block diagram should, we, we want to keep it as simple as possible. No simpler, of course, because then it wouldn't be yeah. accurate, but <laughs> you know, it, 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 it is showing uh, control and, and you, you should not read into, um, into any bus widths here, you know, because I'm just trying to get an idea of what the FPGA requirements might be, but that's a little premature. I would say yes, that, that the individual requirements for FPGA, uh, for, the, for the particular FPGA, are, are it would not be, um, not be reflected here. What we want is to, for this to be modular, for the FPGA processor board to essentially be replaced by almost any SDR. That's the, that, and the, there were some dramatic changes um, from from the original block diagram um, from just from from a month ago, where like things like ADCs were not on the FPGA processor board, where we had an enormous amount of signals crossing the dotted lines, um, and we just decided that the natural way to do this or a natural approach to this was to say this board is not really an FPGA carrier. This board should be a, a standalone SDR, and that dramatically reduced the number of signals crossing over from one board to the other. And it also opened up uh, a lot more flexibility in terms of what kind of equipment can go in there. So for, for very, later, oh, so go, go ahead. Looks very familiar, actually. It should, it, this should look familiar. In fact, the goal here is for, for us to show this at reviews and everybody go, so, you know, yes, you, you do need a thorough review of everything, but it, it should not um, raise a bunch of objections or questions or, or have any obvious risk. Right. That box has pretty much been there, done that for most of the hardware. Yes, yes. The, the real, the, the innovation for, uh, for this particular project for, and for our 6 u is, is in the functionality that is um, in the open source firmware and software. That hardware, Wherever possible, we, we use the open hardware license from CERN or from whoever else, like Tapper. Um, but, you know, we're just, we're going to leverage very reliable, uh, plentiful, inexpensive hardware wherever we can. And, you know, the, well, what are we trying to liberate here? We're, we're trying to liberate, you know, world-class uh, DSP. And, um, and, and we're tr also trying to uh, open source, things like control, finite state machines, the decision making, operations, th those sorts of things. And so far so good. This is, uh, this, anyway, this is sort of a behind the scenes, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, part, the process is well underway. All of the hard work that we've been doing for years is, uh, is recognized, valued. Um, the collaboration is, is very good. And um, I'm optimistic that we will, in another month or two, have a, uh, a lot more uh, done, documented and done. All right, what other questions? Um, 
one thing from my side. Um, yes, sir. Um, sorry if, if it's a, if it's a basic question. I don't have the complete knowledge. Uh, when when we were discussing, uh, you said that if FPGA goes wrong, then the traffic will route through transponders. Will shift to transponders. Um, that's a kind of duplicacy that we maintain. Now uh, my question here is. Um, we are using FPGA because we require some processing like Im implementation of this decoders, LDPC, PCH. Now, if it goes through transponder, then we won't have all this processing. So why can't we have two FPGAs running in parallel so that uh, we have HA, higher availability? Is my question correct? That's, I don't know, yeah. Oh, it's a very, it's a very, very good question. And um, there is nothing stopping us from doing exactly that except space uh, and and money. And power. And power, yes. Uh, FPGAs and, and, and SDRs can be uh, very power hungry. We, we have a, a, a great opportunity with Arex, with amateur radio exploration and gateway, because we don't have to build the power, the, the spacecraft itself, that we can concentrate on the communications, which is our core competency. So we know, we have a number uh, of, a, a large number of watts that NASA says that we can use. So at this time, today, we could do exactly what you have suggested, which, which is not a basic question. Handling redundancy and the trade-offs, uh, you know, how many extra boards, how many extra parts do I need to, uh, to use in order to achieve, you know, six nines of reliability? It has to be balanced with how much can I afford and how much more complicated is it? Because when you have one thing fail, well, your thing failed and you can't use it. Mm -hmm. If you have two things, then you have, to dis you have to be able to monitor and test between those two things, voting or you know, a, a switch of some sort or a relay. Mm -hmm. And that little bit of complexity is so worth it because now you've, you've, you've bought a whole lot of reliability for just a little bit more. But if you had three or seven or nine, you can see where it start. It may start become that the that the monitoring and the control software and hardware may become uh, more error prone than the underlying functionality. So those and, and you get what the economists call the law of diminishing returns. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, but yeah, to sh to Anshul's question, um, uh, could you not have a spare board that you know? You said you're going to have the uh, there's going to be kind of monitoring of the F. FGP, uh, FPGA board anyway. Um, could you not have a spare board there that doesn't draw any power until a condition arises that yes. requires it to be there? So yep. you, you, could. Know, you could solve the power problem simply by not having it running all the time until the first one fails. Yes, and yes. There, there, are that, there are techniques for uh, cold versus hot stored, uh, cold and hot redundancy. That's, that's uh, you're, you're spot on. So yes, the, this this diagram um, sh should not be interpreted as as preventing an entire extra layer, you know, stack of of FPGA processor boards beneath it. So so I, the answer is absolutely yes. That that could be uh, something that would be um, you know it does require some additional control and circuitry. Um, but no, these aren't aren't these are are good questions. The architecture does not prevent that. This is the minimum. So. You know, if you look over to the C-band receiver and X-band transmitter, you'd you could also make the same argument. Um, the 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 key thing is the um, like the high power amplifier. So that is uh, key, absolutely key for the X-band transmitter. So so what do you do to to make that um, work? To make it redundant? You know, do you have several of them? Do you just invest a lot of time in um, in getting the absolute best that you can? You know, so these questions are scattered all around. Um, you know, the, the a level of redundancy is an implementation decision. So at the architecture stage, you know, this is this is the minimum required to get your to get it operating in the way uh, intended to address the architecture. So it's, it is not exclusive or prescribing that this is the only way to do it. This is your minimum. And then uh, questions of, of implementation, like which FPGA design, whether you even have an SDR, uh, those sorts of things are, are implementation that should be supported by this document. 
one of the goals of writing good documentation is to not prevent or destroy a future um, good implementation or uh, a varietal of, of, of work. So we're, we're mindful of that. And um, I think it might actually be worth uh, taking the good questions here and then making it more explicit in the document to address the questions brought up today. So you want to describe what you want it to do, not how you're going to do it. Yes, that's that's a that is what I believe a good architecture document should do. And mm -hmm. you know, the, of course, there 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 are diverse opinions on on how far architecture documents should go. But but I, I am in heated agreement with what you just said. So that, that's the stage of work that this particular uh, batch of effort is aimed at, um, and it's a. Uh, it's, it's going to be reviewed. We have a team meeting on the 25th of June. We're anticipating having a PDR or a preliminary design review uh, right after that, later in that week. The, the others, there is other major schedule milestones, but, but for, for the work that is being done for payload, that is, that's the big one. On the ground side, uh, I mentioned that we had we have funding for ground. Ground the, the biggest sort of challenge there is the mechanical design. Our goal is to make a inexpensive, durable uh, tracking dish uh, setup that people can use, you know, not just for gateway, but also for Leo, Leo, Heo, Geo, uh, all the orbits. There are, uh, there's rotators out there. They're ex really expensive and there's lots of complaints that they just don't last. And there hasn't been a major um, like a rotator in, in design uh, in a while. There's an awful lot of interest. Um, the interesting challenge that ORI has run into with doing mechanical design is that unlike hardware and software, electronic hardware and software and firmware, um, but especially software, software has a strong open source tra tradition and legal protections and um, just a lot of momentum and almost like gravitas at this point. In mechanical design, there is no strong tradition of open source work. And you can see in other organizations, uh, you know, everyone from Librespace to AMSAT, um, you can see that the, the volunteers for things like thermal design and mechanical are fewer and they are precious and you will see the same names over and over again. And it is a sort of a cultural thing between the different types of engineering. So that is why we started trying to raise money specifically for mechanical design for the ground station. The wonderful work that's been done with firmware and electronic hardware and software is uh, what's being shared here and on the payload. But the, that, that part uh, is much more easy to find volunteers to donate their, their time. For mechanical, it looks like we are going to have to uh, hire somebody to, to do the work. Uh, and that has been a very interesting experience because um, the people that are very that we've talked to are very interested in the project and very enthusiastic. And in three cases so far, the first three volunteers, uh, mechanical engineering volunteers, we they met or got got, a, got contacts through o Open Research Institute and got better jobs and got much busier. So I, I would. I view that as a big success because Open Research Institute is supposed to help people uh, learn and break down the barriers between high tech, uh, you know, and achievement and all that. Uh, it's great, but I, it, it, it's, uh, it's funny to, to, uh, to lose a, uh, a volunteer uh, to, to a better job because you introduced them <laughs> to people that help them. So that's where we're at on mechanical, you know. So when I say we may have to pay someone, it means like put out a, uh, write a contract and, and get somebody to, to work. Uh, and they've got, got some, made some headway there. Uh, so it's been an interesting experience comparing and contrasting software open source uh, design with um, mechanical engineering open source, which it's, it's I, I can't say it's non-existent because you know, that would be an unfair statement, but wow, the traditions and the, the uh, culture between uh, hardware, mechanical design and software are very different. Another question. Sure. Uh, I know you haven't had very long to think about this, just a couple of hours, but uh, uh, what is likely to change with respect to activities uh, in the next, say, three months as a result of now achieving full funding? 
Yes, uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, Marty Wall is, um, you're a member of the board of directors of YASME, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes, uh, and, and the, the news, the, good, the wonderful news about uh, full funding came this morning. So um, I, I'm still somewhat incoherent and happy. Um, th what will change will be the, the drag or the resistance to, um, to a lot of the paths forward uh, is gone. So the fundraising consumed um, an enormous amount of time and energy. And it's not that it will stop. Uh, the fundraising for phase two has to continue, um, but the workload will go way down. So what will change is a lot more um, uh, progress forward on the things that needed money. And the things that needed money are hardware. So the um, the path forward will probably be starting to push Eric's and ARES hard for uh, maybe permission or, or uh, some sort of cooperation forward to where the hardware can be used for that, as well as for the 6U project that we're doing. So I would say um, within the next few months, the amount of documentation and um, sort of, okay, now let's talk hardware will we'll, we'll become much more obvious. I don't know if we'll be able to actually build anything within the next quarter. Uh, I would love to be able to build something for, for June. Uh, that would be awesome. So over maybe the next six months, we, we may start seeing some, some hardware demonstration uh, stations that implement the things that we've been talking about. Uh, instead of it being scattered all over benches or cobbled together for, for a demo um, out of uh, commercially available USRPs and things like that, that we will be able to start showing hardware that we've built. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the direction um, that, that you will see. Okay, good. And would you uh, take a stab as to how the completion of funding might affect the overall timetable of the of this entire phase? For phase one, well, yeah. it act, now it will, now it actually can have a timetable instead of being uh, essentially on hold. Uh, the as as far as like I mean, and and that's a huge difference uh, to go from well, you know, we'll we'll just keep collecting money until we get there, which, you know, we we were we were uh, progressing, uh, but the, the when you change the slope and you achieve your goal, then then you can move forward. So now, now instead of having a timetable with a giant asterisk, you know, now I think we can actually start talking about a schedule and builds and uh, milestones. So those, those discussions, I think a lot of the people here on this call will be involved in, you know, and I, I, I don't want to say uh, a year or six months or nine months uh, because there's a lot of things that are out, still out, well outside of our control. For example, we've suspended all travel for ORI, so nobody's traveling to any conferences or events um, until there's nope. a until there's a vaccine. That's so, pretty much the world right now, yes. isn't it? Yes, that's pretty much the world. There's um, we we're fortunate at ORI because we don't have a uh, a lease or an office or employees or anything like that. Um, but the the situation has greatly affected our ability to get together. It's an international organization. We have active people on three continents, I mean, and getting together at events. Um, and those of us that could afford to travel, uh, we're doing a lot of it. So that puts this puts a lot of scheduling uh, kind of kind of up in the air uh, and timetables and things like that. The, now, but now we actually can have one. Um, another example of, of uh, things that are that are uh, dramatically changed in terms of the timetable, we uh, were planning to go to, to Tokyo Ham Fair and that's in October, and we're not we're not going to travel even if they have it. Uh, but that was um, it was looking very likely that we would have a ground station that would be able to do most all of the functions for Gateway for DBBS2 and S2X that we'd be able to demonstrate it in October. That timetable is not not really going to happen. It's not, uh, and for several reasons, for uh, the mechanical the mechanical design has been. Uh, a remarkable experience in terms of trying to get an open source team together uh, and you know just the, the cessation of travel and I don't know how we will be affected in terms of parts for for a build or um, 
for Eric's or for 6G. I'm not sure what will happen with the phase one hardware in terms of, uh, you know, can we get the parts? I think probably Scotty is in similar uh, boat there, you know, because he deals with bombs all the time. Oh, sorry, Bill, Bill's a material yeah. all the time. I, I, he's, I uh, he's also active in this area. So, you know, I, I, I'm usually very careful about setting down a schedule for, for volunteers in the first place, as, as you know, <laughs> from, <laughs> from, a, from a long experience with working in, in many large uh, volunteer organizations. Um, but I can say that we actually now have a timetable, that we have a legit phase one, that fully funding will make a remarkable difference in terms of how quickly forward we can move. And it relieves an enormous amount of stress. And um, that I, the, all of that, that's such a positive direction and it will um, produce a large variety of benefits uh, throughout the organization and for this particular project. Okay, now you, you mentioned the, the need for the uh, uh, mechanical engineering. My understanding from looking at the, the long document that you'd sent around was that uh, this particular, the, the output of this particular phase was not going to be physically configured for space. In other words, right. this is kind of proof of concept. You're not designing it with space qualified materials and so Correct. on. Yes. Uh, so I would presume the mechanical side of it is much, I mean, other than making it look pretty for a demo, is really much less critical. Yeah, the, the main mechanical expenses are for the ground station, which, you know, to, how to physically move a dish and how to make a ground station that is um, durable, cheap, you know, uh, maybe almost low tech. Uh, but you're exactly right. For phase one, for for the for the payload project, uh, the mechanical design is minimal, and the thermal design is minimal. You know, we're relying on uh, it's all terrestrial yeah. and and parts. So that that's you have exactly convection right. cooling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I I, I learned uh, Carrie, Carrie Banky, who who's yeah, here know, in uh, in San Diego, and he did the um, you you were you you're very familiar with the the power supply for mm -hmm. ISS. Uh, so Carrie was the, the lead designer and builder of that. Yeah. And watching that over the past two years um, come to life in his garage was a tour de force of uh, how to design stuff for space. Because, you, you know, so he presents his work one, one, at one of our monthly meetings uh, for the San Diego Microbe Group and then explains that convection doesn't work in space. And about half the room went, what? What? <laughs> I, I, I'm a CPA, not an engineer. And that, that one was pretty obvious. <laughs> Yeah. So, and I sat back and I'm like, oh, so, you know, all of your assumptions about how to do cooling on a, on a board and as Scotty and others yeah. know, you yeah. know, FPGAs can be yeah. hot. They can well, think of all the money you save on heat sinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know what? They're what they're you replace doing. them with pipes. It's, you're exactly right. It's, uh, it's remarkable how, you know, um, the things that you are used to, they just don't work. You know, so your design patterns have to fundamentally shift, to, and he, they ran into a problem. So part of the part of the power supply was getting too hot. They found this somewhat late in the design, but they had to really look hard at it, and they ended up using pipes to to get the uh, to get everything cool, and and it sailed through uh, sailed through all the tests after that. You know, but it didn't crop up until fairly late. And you know, for a while there, it's like, oh, great. You know, how much how much do we have to rip up in order to achieve uh, thermal? So thermal design is actually uh, Dr. Bridges, the partner for the, the architecture work. That's his top concern. What is thermal? Because the moon uh, is brutal, and the space station, the gateway, will experience temperature swings that are just nuts. And that is that's his main concern. So. All of the work, um, you know, even though we're focusing on the communications payload, you know, and it's electronics, hardware, and software, uh, the thermal is just that that can take you out alone. You know, it's a uh, it's and then designing everything for thermal, got to worry about that too. So everything that we learn, um, we will what we what our job when I say our job, ORI's job is to is to learn and then open source it and everything you know any work that we do along the way that we create we um we publish immediately and, and this is how we comply with a large number of legal regulations and and also how we um uh, you know 
live up to our mission of, of open source. So it's, uh, it's not, not just because open source is great, but uh, publishing everything along the way that we learn. Uh, so not just the designs and, and not just schematics, uh, and not just software and hardware, but the, the actual um, you know, synthesized, like here is how you achieve this type of engineering. Those sorts of discussions are the things that we must record and share, make sure that everybody has access to that uh, because the, a lot of cases, the, the documentation or the software um, is not enough to reproduce a design. And that's something that the CERN Open Hardware License addresses. Uh, you know, what, what is a design? It's not just the schematics and the, and the software listing, but it's uh, the explanations and the process, uh, system architecture work, or uh, good design patterns, um, good practices, best practices. Uh, the sort of the checklist of what you have to care about. As you as you publish these these things, um, are you getting any uh, constructive feedback from unexpected sources? In other words, are people coming out of the woodwork to answer and try to resolve questions or problems? Yes, that's that's one of the reasons why you publish early and often, and to as diverse uh, a group as possible. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, and and it's uh, sometimes it's it's just like with anything when you when you put it out there, uh, you, you might you might get someone that it only really cares um, that you've you've used the wrong background color for your <laughs> video, <laughs> you know, or uh, it, it does open you up to some some maybe not very kind comments or some some attacks or or some negativity, but. Uh, Anybody that does, that seeks out comment and critique and review and wants broad review, you quickly learn uh, that, that that's okay and you don't let it stop you or bother you and you, you go straight to what is the heart, what's the, what is the critique, what's the value of this, no matter how it's packaged. And yes, we've, we've achieved routine and regular positive constructive feedback that way. It's always nice when it's delivered tactfully, but it doesn't have to be for us to use it, uh, you know, and good dialogue, reaching back to the person and closing the loop as much as possible. Um, you know, we've, we've ended up with volunteers that way. So it's a, I give you an enthusiastic yes, uh, that, that putting the work out there has improved it dramatically in unexpected ways. Good, and good. Yeah, um, I, we had something similar when we were, uh, uh, we were redoing the uh, VHF, UHF uh, microwave band plans for ARRL. Uh, they were they were you know hopeless at one point and a couple of us got on and and we put everything out there for people to come back with and sometimes you know they came back with something that was really suitable for new england but not for the rest of the country you know and so we had to kind of take that and thank them and and uh put it in perspective so i imagine so you're having to do the same thing yes and Yes, the, the, um, the diversity of perspectives or the level of perspective, some people are very close to a particular problem or have a very regional or local approach. And then the neat thing is that that's valid and, and good because as I'm sure you probably saw, if you did get a huge number of local responses, uh, very localized band plan sorts of concerns or, you know, and this happens with the coordination too. You know, I've seen this happen with coordination at, on two meters. Um, over time, the people that are collecting these and looking at it, you start seeing patterns. You start seeing things that you can extract from, from the population of, of feedback. And you go, oh, you know what? We may not be able to fix your particular individual problem, but we can back off and we can provide you a rule or a structure uh, that will, will, will work for the greatest common You can good. lower the angst level for 80% of your commenters. Yes, and that's yeah. a huge win. You know, things worth doing are rarely easy, you know. Yeah. Do you have time for another question? Sure, of course. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to have to leave here in, in a few minutes. Of course. Please uh, speak up. Yeah, so this is Mike Parker. Uh, and we were involved in the CATSAT uh, program, and um, it, which is still alive, by the way, despite the virus. Oh, good. <laughs> and and uh, we we're... We've gone through our preliminary design review, and uh, we're shooting for a finished spacecraft uh, by next uh, end of next March. We hope. 
So uh, this, uh, my question is about open source. We, there's, a, there's a software package that's been around in the government uh, industry world for the last, oh, started 40 or so years ago. And uh, I actually wrote the open source uh, uh, license for it based on the Free Software Foundation model about uh, 25 years ago. Uh, and we're about to turn this loose. We're about to hand it over to the U of A to, for its ground station use. And um, I'd like to, if you have some people that are in, I assume you do, that are involved in the legalities of what, what we're doing so we don't screw something up. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the, in the question. This, this software is going to be released uh, as EAR 99 which means it's export restricted, you can't, but, um, and so we're being very cautious about who we hand it to and how we hand it to people, because uh, we don't want to be responsible for it being sent to uh, one of several countries that, it, that it, it, the government will not be happy about and come back and charge us a lot of money for. Uh, so, uh, What's the, what's the situation? Is, do you have people that and would you guys be interested in talking about this? Yes, that's, a, that's an area of great interest for, for us. And yes, I will write you. I have your email. And we will get on it um, right away. Okay, yeah, there's, there's no urgency on my part. I, I have, I, I'm, I'm handing it out to several people you know, that, that I know and trust and, and, ex, and expect to, uh, I don't want to, handed out to the world right away because I know that we're going to have some growing pains of, well, why does it run on my computer type of problem? Right. right. All the usual problems, plus an additional layer of regulatory problem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, I, under, I understand. Uh, but uh, the, go the goal is, is to, in some, to people that are interested in it, uh, to get, get it to them. This is a software package, by the way, that was just demonstrated at the Tapper MSAT a joint meeting in Tucson. It must have been about 25 years ago. And unfortunately, uh, at, at that point, there was very little interest from the hams because it was running on some very expensive computers. Uh, and of course, the computers aren't so expensive anymore. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, That's a, this is something we deeply care about. Um, we've done a uh, pretty, substantial amount of, of legal and regulatory work to try to get um, amateur, well, specifically the amateur radio satellite service work um, to be judged, uh, decided that it is not, not under ITAR and therefore moves out from under ITAR and it can also move out from under EAR, which you mentioned the EAR 99. So we're heavily invested in this and the, um, the, our commodity jurisdiction request was submitted in February and it may take many more months before we get an answer and that answer is the start of a long process of uh, you know, reg regulatory work to try to get to a state where um, concerns about um, software especially and, uh, and also hardware um, you know, being able to uh, collaborate and, and have it be uh, open source and freely work on it. That's the goal that we, uh, the ORI wants to get to. So we we have a network of people that are very good at this and understand the risks and how to approach it. And um, I we can I think that we can come up with some some a set of um, you know summary at least a summary of here's the different paths uh, ranging from extremely conservative to what we think you can honestly get away with if you're willing to uh, take the risk of interpreting what's been been written in the regulatory sphere. So uh, yeah, count me in. I, I'm, I'm happy to help. And, uh, you know, I, I'm optimistic that, uh, that we can give you uh, at least more of a, of a better, uh, maybe a better or more confident place uh, to, to, at least to make for, for, uh, further decisions about, about this particular software package. And also thank you for the tremendous amount of, of work and all that you have done over many years in this area. Um, if you don't know who Mike Parker is, then uh, please look him up. 
And uh, if you want to read more about CATSAT, a uh, recent issue of the AMSAT Journal discussed it. And it also, I believe, there's a paper in this past year's uh, symposium proceedings. So it's an excellent project, very exciting. Yeah, you're, you're correct, there is a paper in, in uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen the journal article yet because I accidentally let my membership lapse. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm handling that right now. Okay. <laughs> well, the good news is that you can now um, up your re up your membership online. Uh, it's a brand new system at uh, msat.org. So, thank you, thank you, Mike. All right. Any other questions? Uh, hi, this is Zach Lefty from uh, VT. I have a, uh, hopefully a couple of quick questions about Gateway. Um, sure. Do we, do we have any more insight into or maybe firm numbers on power budget uh, in terms of DC power? Uh, or is that the kind of thing that we're hoping to maybe bang on them a little harder to, to refine down? Okay, so I, I, I hope I'm not misquoting Frank Bauer. He said 100 watts or okay. more. Or more. And is that continuous? That sounded. I know continuous. orbit average is a little bit anomalous when you're talking about gateway orbit, but yeah, uh, yeah. Um, well, yeah. The the uh, the power for gateway should be pretty stable. The way that the spacecraft is oriented, um, and we have a document about this. We um, we learned how to use GMAT, the generic mission analysis tool from, which is open source by the way, the open source right. tool from NASA. So we were able to get the orbit. Uh, sort of uh, nailed down in, in GMAT. And the, the way that NASA describes this and the way that, um, that the mission will go is that the uh, solar panels for Gateway will face the sun all the time and that there shouldn't be uh, interruption of power. So this 100 watts that has been on Frank Bauer's slides, that's an early number. The, essentially NASA shrugged and went, why, why are you worried about power? There's plenty of power. You know, now, as time goes on with complicated missions and they start dividing things up, that's the, that's a number that all of us are looking very hard at, you know, and, but we do have at least one number in print that we all were extremely happy. Well, with. it depends on who you get a ride with too, doesn't it? Yeah, it depends on who is going to, um, who's going to be picked as the, there's a bunch of contractors involved, right? You know, the way, the way that we're uh, scheduled, uh, may, scheduled maybe to, uh, too strong of a word, but the, the where we have a spot is on the logistics module, and the logistics module travels out or is built in space and attaches itself to Gateway, and it's there for some number of months. Then it's detached and will be in a heliocentric orbit, which gives us possibly another opportunity to have a cool um, amateur payload as it as it drifts away from from the space station and gets further and further away. Um, so since we're on the logistics module, the you know, and not uh, built into the power and propulsion unit, not in the halo, uh, which is the habitation module that we're on logistics, um, and and that seems to be that is stuck for for a while, for over a year, uh, that gives you some bounds on on power. So we do expect to have plenty of power. Uh, as far as like, was it going to remain 100 watts? I hope so. It could it could go higher than that. So that's that's what I know today, uh, as of today, for for the uh, logistics unit and the power. None of the contractors are done. All of this is in flux. Dramatic things have changed just over the past month. For example, you know there was a widely reported that Gateway was no longer in the critical path for boots on the moon in 2024, but everybody says that that is way too early anyway. Then it was um, everything's going to be built in space versus we're going to launch the the logistics module from the ground. Uh, the, there's been wild swings in how the thing is going to be built. There's lots of people uh, working very hard on it and lots and lots of companies involved. So what I've said today could completely change. The work produced so far, uh, even if the entire project was canceled, would not go away. It's all completely reusable work, sure. uh, which is which is good. So you have to be prepared for, and also something um, that that you should probably know, uh, or that you may already know. Frank Frank Bauer, who's the um, the lead for for Arex for amateur radio exploration, has made it very clear that we should not get high centered or distracted or too focused on gateway. That the overall lunar orbiting platform 
project and this new uh, commercial space race, we actually have a lot, we have more opportunities than just Gateway. So while I speak a lot about Gateway and talk about Gateway and it's Gateway this and Gateway that, this architecture is supposed to support Arex, so the amateur radio exploration, which is interplanetary, lunar, uh, wherever we can get opportunities. And he's been um, very proactive in talking to and making it clear that we want amateur payloads on a wide variety of things, including interplanetary. So, uh, so having said that, it's, uh, there's a lot going on and a lot of opportunities. The, 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 one, the reason why Gateway keeps coming up is because that's the one that's actually getting built. That has, uh, you know, they have multiple phases and, and the first phase has been funded for a while. Uh, so, so, you know, focusing and working towards something that looks like, as of today, is actually going to get built and put in space is, is a good bet. But know that we are looking at other uh, opportunities to put amateur radio hardware on, uh, on spacecraft. Excellent. Uh, I have one or two, hopefully, also quick questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you ever ask any quick questions. <laughs> I know. I, they, the questions are quick, but then the discussion takes hours. That's right. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Uh, we, we also had a student looking at the gateway orbit problem this uh, semester and um, things slowed and then ramped back up and then we got some final results. It was all the COVID delays and working remotely and all that kind of stuff, but we got it all sorted out. Um, the, the quick version of the takeaway that we got is deltas from the moon uh, in terms of pointing angles. And so mm -hmm. what I'm trying yeah. to get to is doing a generic link budget analysis uh, yeah. kind of based on this, this model. Yeah. We're working. And, um, we're working on the exact same thing. We've we've done. We looked at Azel and uh, and looked at and the link budget is directly informed by the by the GMAT. So we're we're right with you. What's your right? Question? And uh, the question is, do we know anything about attitude? Will we be able to uh, yes. kind of stay pointed generally towards Earth, or are um, we going to have to worry about spinning around that kind of thing? You're going you to have to. Oh yeah, you're going to have to worry about spinning around. In fact, the station points at the sun and not at the Earth. So that axis towards the sun means that the Earth goes around. You know those old little balls that followed along with the words on the bottom of the screen so you could do sing-alongs? That's yes. kind of what the Earth looks like it's doing. Do, 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 do. It does this little, and it goes faster towards the bottom. So, so we have some animations that show this, but it's not that simple. Of course not, because uh, the whole station may rotate around this axis uh, as, for example, logistics module shows up or halo shows up or some sort of module shows up and the entire thing may need to turn around uh, in order for, they said radiation pressure or, or drag or something like that, space stuff. So, you know, right. Okay. Uh, so space stuff happens. And I went, so I looked at this, I looked at our GMAT and I went, okay, it's great to know the orbit and it's great to know that you need, you know, it's a 20 degree bounce uh, from the, you know, from gateway perspective, looking at Earth, and it's uh, over the course of an entire year. Then you, of course, have the variations over the over the year. Okay, all that's great and beautiful and looks good in animation, but if the entire station is spinning around the axis aimed at the sun, then it's an omnidirectional challenge. Right. Okay. Yeah. That that's I guess the kind of next step challenge that I'm hoping to get more information on, uh, because yeah, our our current model is very simplistic in terms of just a vanilla gateway orbit, but there's a lot of information we don't have that I'd like to be able to uh, keep moving forward with. Um, that student, unfortunately, same same problem with volunteers finding good jobs. Uh, students <laughs> tend to graduate and move on. You yes. find the superstars and then they get really good job offers and then they leave you. Yes. Uh, so we are looking for the next student to kind of pick this up, but uh, lunar stuff is very exciting right now. So we think that won't be a problem. There's gonna be lots of students interested in this. Um, but it's kind of that source, you know, it's, it's like any good software package. It doesn't matter how good the software is if it's garbage in, uh, in terms of data. So, uh, you'll just get garbage out. So, uh, I'd like to just stay, stay involved with that as much as possible. And, and, uh, if there's maybe Eric's meetings that I could actually attend and stay kind of receive only mode, <laughs> I don't know if that's feasible, but I'd love to try to get closer to the source data. Um, or even if that's through ORI and just making sure that I'm, I feel like I'm not saying it's uh, engaged enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. Wanna... The, uh, for, well, I mean, if you, if you want to keep, uh, the, uh, okay. So once again, it was a short question and with uh, pl plenty of answers. So of course, uh, 
you can you can request or I can request that you are able to attend the uh, the Eric meetings. There's a teleconference on the second and fourth Thursdays, and it's the invite list is pretty dauntingly large, um, but there's no reason that you wouldn't want to to be involved given your um, your your job, given the contributions from Virginia Tech, given the interest and the potential collaboration, given previous collaborations and existing agreements between AMSAT and VT and, and ARIS. Uh, or, you know, if you just wanted to keep up with the GMAT, we publish the entire thing and there's a GMAT document tracker to show like walk somebody through from the very beginning to the to where we are today and the scripts are are in the appendices you know so I mean you can you can take that and run with it that's the document the writing is where we um, describe the things that we find out like this whole thing about the station flipping around was from a recent NASA teleconference that uh, that Frank went to you know so we're we're trying to record and decimate and get get it out or, or do both, you know, you, you don't have to rely on us and the published work. Uh, you can attend the meetings directly, but if you if you just wanted to keep up with uh, Orbit stuff and then uh, and, and it's published. Actually, the, I've, I've discovered the best way to, for me to be helpful and productive is to try to get out of the way. Um, so if that's <laughs> GMAT stuff, yeah. <laughs> if, if all of that, the GMAT documentation and all that kind of stuff is uh, uh, like on a, a website or GitHub or something like that, yeah. um, the best way that I think I could help is find the student and then point them to that document because I'm not going to be the one that actually does the orbit. Um, I know that we, we are very biased towards STK at uh, Virginia Tech, which is not open source and is very expensive. Uh, yeah. But I think it would be great if we uh, kind of injected GMAT um, into maybe not the curriculum, but at least into projects. Um, so, okay, yeah, I'll help. That is smart. That, yeah. That's probably the smartest way to move forward, and and not necessarily directly attend the Eric's meeting. Yeah, uh, because not every meeting is about things like the, not every meeting at the at that level is going to to be about the things that um that we're talking about. I'll just I'm going to let you guys distill down the important stuff for us. <laughs> we'll do our best, you know, and, and if there's something that you need to know that we're not producing, then, then you just speak up and somebody will, will be on it, you know. So, yeah, the GMAT, the, the, the GMAT is great. Um, it's, it's got all the idiosyncrasies of a complex piece of software. It's, sure. uh, it's very precise. It's high fidelity. It's what they use for planning their missions. Uh, it's well worth the investment. Um, and really, you can get up to speed without too much trouble. There's a, some non-intuitive stuff. It's the usual story. But yeah, we couldn't afford the software that you're talking about, SPK. I think I looked at it. And then there's a couple of other packages. Another, another open source um, tool is Polyastro. Um, but, and that was going to be the, the next thing that we, uh, or I, uh, tried uh, after GMAT. Because we absolutely have to develop some uh, ADAC or um, attitude determination and control modes for the 6U project. We, we have to be able to master those sorts of things. And so GMAT came up as something we needed uh, and Polyastro right after that. But GMAT so far has, uh, has been able to, uh, pr to produce the sorts of results and to give us the data that we need in order to figure out how to point antennas, how to design a link budget, how to, how to handle all that stuff. Uh, so I took an action item to make sure that everything is findable. Um, and that the, the we'll, we'll get that sorted out and and um, yeah just and I'll check in with you to to see uh, later in the summer. Do you, you have anybody working over the summer at all at VT? We do. I'm actually in the office right now. Uh, we're considered part of the essential uh, folks. Uh, the the national security side. There's only so many places on the planet that we can go to do some of our work. Um, so that lets us get into the building. Yeah. Um, and we do actually have some students working over the summer. It's mostly remote, um, but there's a, Virginia starting a, like a phase two ramp up uh, where we can get students back in the lab, but with very controlled conditions uh, to, be, to be safe and only if it's absolutely necessary. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll see about the fall. I think they're, they're waiting to make that announcement, but we do have a, a good number of astromechanics uh, and, and AOE students that are uh, gonna be working remotely looking for projects. And this is the perfect kind of thing to hand off I can think of two of them off the top of my head uh, that would be great candidates for this to kind of pick it up and keep going with it. Okay. Um, I've, so I've my last. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
Oh, I just I took an action item to get back in touch with you to make sure um, that your any potential students that want to work on gateway orbits have everything that we have. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then the the last note, uh, it's still about pointing and and all that kind of stuff. Is uh, have we have we thought about? Uh, I, I think I've mentioned this maybe on one or two emails and on some of the listservs, but. Um, what what is going to be the equivalent of like sat pc 32 uh for things that are not in leo for the average amateur user right so i, I think the problem that we might run into is everybody's used to using sat pc 32 and that's a tle based sgb4 orbital propagator right mm -hmm. and right. now we need something completely different to be able to point antennas at not at the moon but at something near the moon Right, or as things drift away from the moon, right, and somewhere else out there in the in the solar system. So, um, the lead I have on that is is Skyfield and the um, uh, which is a Python package for um, astromechanics type stuff, and then um, the uh, Horizons database from JPL, which I assume the the TLE not TLE but the uh, trajectory information, ephemerides, that kind of thing. Um, might wind up in horizons, but not all things in the solar system are in horizons. Um, so I, I hope that gateway stuff winds up in horizons, but I don't know. And there's there's nice Python packages for accessing that that API and getting that, and then being able to run, kind of pull the ephemerides from JPL's database and then use Skyfield to compute your pointing angles and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of one thread I'm pulling, um, and I have a couple of students looking at, but. Uh, I'm wondering if there's some other plan or if anybody's thought about that. Uh, what I'm not really good at is but like production software. I know there's a lot of folks involved in, in this effort and everything, they can probably do that better. But um, I'm just curious if there's any other uh, look at that yet. No, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and if anybody else on the call has some has more information or uh, than I do, please chip in. Um, I know for a fact that um, that Librispace and Satnogs are extremely interested in this question, and okay. that they are working on um, adding because uh, they concentrate, as you know, mostly on Leo. Um, right. But they it, are very excited about higher Earth orbit packages that they can track and anything, especially and in, in including um, amateur. So um, I don't know what level uh, of of software either experimentation or source code that's been written yet for that but that is one big blob of people that are very serious about adding uh, ex expanding their database and automated tracking of, of payloads in orbit including gateway and and things uh, you know other other targets so that's one of them uh, and I'll just I'll dig around and find out for for our particular ground station we just didn't really figure that it would be uh, terribly hard to develop the orbit for uh, for Gateway since we can look at it in GMAT and we can look at it in other, uh, you know, you predict is another option that a lot of us use. Um, and since we're familiar with the author of GPredict, uh, I can, I'll just ask him and see what he thinks, you know, what he thinks the obvious path forward is. Uh, so so I'll, I'll poke around and see. Is that your question? Yeah, a good one. You know, we, we have these established databases and we have these things that we're used to do, using and those tools may not cover what we are moving, uh, moving rapidly towards being able to do. So I think it's right. an excellent question. Um, you know, excellent. I'm just trying to think towards the, the user community. Like I know probably a lot of us are a little more comfortable with the, the more exotic orbit type stuff, but getting, getting your average ham, you know, if it's not immediately plug and play and easy to just get on the air, uh, right. then they might get turned off the whole project in general. So yeah. if we can start taking on that, I think that'd be good. Uh, yeah, and, and, but, okay. and back to, there's a, and then Scott, Scotty, do you, do you know of anything in this particular area? I know that the, like the Tangerine SDR is being aimed towards um, like ionospheric work and, and not necessarily payload work, but you, you may have some insight here in terms of software uh, that that would be, or anybody that might be working. Do you know of anything? You mean like who's working on software? Well, like for for uh, expanding the, the the sorts of things that we track. You know, do you, have you heard of any any of that in this particular area? 
Well, the, the software that they're mostly working on right now is networking software to collect data. That's kind of the focus is uh, thousands of stations grabbing lots of data and shoving it up onto the cloud in some manner. And, you know, starting small and going bigger. But okay. uh, as, as far as specific software, I mean, we've got guys at University of Alabama working on it, but that's all we've got right now. And of course, I'd like to have it uh, when we get our, our published spec for the data interface, we'd like to hopefully have more people look at our spec and say, oh, okay, I can interface to that and write software to do other things. But right now it's mostly data collection that, that we're focusing on. Okay. First, that's our first, um, uh, uh, I guess, use case. Our first use case is that. Okay, thanks. So, All right, Zach, I think, I think I'll take, I'll just take that as an action item and go see if there's anybody that's, um, that's actively looking at this and has a, maybe if they see an, a path forward, we can, we can put okay. it into some more. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something I'm also uh, particularly interested in. And one idea that I've had is to uh, get, get student, uh, as always, my solution is get a student on it. And uh, uh, <laughs> we have a few that would be interested in kind of a, uh, maybe this can be something like there's a central server. You need a network connection anyway, even to download TLEs. Right. Yeah. So if there's a network connection, maybe there's something else that's doing the hardcore computing and kind of like you mentioned with Gpredict, uh, like a network based interface where you submit a query. Here's my position. Here's what I'm trying to point at. And it returns a response to you for maybe the next six hours. Here are the pointing angles that you care about. Right. Okay. And then you use that to run your software for a passive gateway or something like that. So I uh, I, I'm brainstorming now, which is a, usually a waste of time on calls like that. So, uh, <laughs> but that's yeah. kind of the direction that I might try to kick something to, to some students to look at to see if uh, well, they can come up with a solution. You've, that, you've brought like, up something that's really kind of key. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Scotty, did you have a question? I was just going to say that sounds sort of like what we're doing in reverse because you want information as opposed to supplying information. Like yes. Right. Yeah, but I'm correct. wondering, you know, that, that kind of – the network architecture that you're already working on for the, uh, uh, I think it's related to the personal space weather station, uh, so the Tangerine SDR and all of that. Um, it, it might could flow in both directions, right? And most of the time it's uploading data, something like that, and then maybe we can take a duplicate of that, and that's how um, the community can download the pointing information they need. Ideally, it would be able to run standalone, right? So they, you know, they just download the ephemerides and then all the algorithms are running on their computer, but uh, maybe there's, and there can be a mix of solutions too. Like I said, I'm brainstorming that might be a <laughs> too many rabbit holes in tangent. So. No, it's, you some, yeah. there's some good stuff in there. There's um, there's some work that's been done by um, by Steve Conklin, and and there's another another set of set of related work uh, from from people like uh, Paul Williamson. So I think that we have an, at least enough horsepower um, in the in the community, uh, you know, ORI plus. Topper, um, you know, with the, and all of the the people that are working on Tangerine SDR, I think, and Satnogs and LibreSpace, I think it's a good time to um, to maybe go ahead and write up a proposal. We sort of kind of are moving towards like what are the what are the expanded requirements for software that just works that allows you to point at whatever you can communicate with whatever or whatever you want to listen to. And I, I know that that overall goal is uh, very much in keeping with the overall goals of, of groups like, like Satnogs. And well, yeah. I know we have a data channel both ways. And since we have a single board computer as part of our, our system, I think that's eminently doable if you, that's what you, but finding someone to write the code, that's what you're looking for really, right? Yeah. I and have every, students. <laughs> Right. Everything's the trouble with most of the traditional software packages and even with Satnogs itself that we ran into right off the bat when we said, okay, well, how can we get a microwave geo payload supported in Satnogs? How, how do we do that? Yeah, geo, you can say it doesn't move, but it really does. You know, unless you're absolutely synchronous, you will trace out a little figure eight in the sky. And if you have a very narrow beam width, then you need, maybe you need to worry, right? And then looking at gateway, wow, you know, it's not just tracking the moon. It comes way away from the moon and goes very close uh, over right. the course of a week. So you, it's not as easy as just pointing at the moon, and especially at microwave, you have to you have to point. So the trouble with all these software packages is one of architecture. They're all based on passes, 
So that is how it's, it's built into, uh, for example, SATNOGs. Everything is a pass. Well, what right. do you do with a pass that doesn't go anywhere? You, you divide by zero and it goes puke, you know. So those sorts of things, like you, you, it, it requires at least some refactoring in the code bases that I am familiar with. And in terms of like expressing it in TLEs, I hope that works, you know, because then the, all of the databases and all of the good APIs that you've brought up can all work. So it sounds like we should probably maybe start discussing it or, you know, uh, uh, run around and talk to some people. Idea. Okay. Fake TLEs. Yep. Can you take the ephemeris data and generate fake TLEs that make existing software work? That's another track that, mm -hmm. that sounds. Yeah, really that would be at. like a do no harm approach. You know, that would right. be, and you know, it would, uh, and it also would not require like what Scotty brings up, you know, uh, a whole, whole new bunch of software being written. Right. You know, I mean, we have a, we have a, we have wonderful sets of communities ranging from GNU radio to, to us and to, you know, tapper, but like, you know, it's not like a spigot. You can't just turn on a faucet and get a bunch of free software. You know, sure. Wish it would work that way, but it doesn't. Makes effort. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions, okay. Zach? No, thank you very much for allowing me the time. I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> well, I hope not. This is great stuff. All right. Any, anyone else? Any other questions? I have a question for Zachary. Do you know Alan Michaels? Oh, I, yeah. So he is the director of our electronic systems lab. I, I work with him frequently. I'm actually in the aerospace systems lab at the Hume Center. Uh, so my boss is Dr. Black, who is the, the director of a AOSL, and uh, Dr. Michaels is the director of ESL. So yeah, I, I actually work on multiple projects with him. We cross-pollinate our labs a lot. And that is right. that's, where, that's where the magic happens. If you can do crazy signal processing with crazy space missions, then you can take over the world, right? So. Um, uh, yeah, I know pretty well. If you're in across them, say hi. Uh, we worked with them before years ago. I haven't, not so much recently, but uh, in the past. Yeah, we'll do. I have a weekly phone call with them for one of our programs. So yeah, I'll I'll, I'll let them know. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Good stuff. All right. Any other questions? Keith, would you like to say anything? You've been uh, quiet. Keith is one of our uh, Open Research Institute board members, and thank you very much for, for chipping in today. Got any questions or concerns or things to tell the tell the group? Well, no, no questions. Uh, I think it's great that uh, we've got this many folks uh, uh, showing like this to talk about the projects and uh, forward. So. Uh, you know, everyone keep up, keep up the good work. We're in strange times now, and it's great to see people focused on on making a, a, a positive support. I have a question for Keith. What is that thing in the background that's uh, swirling uh, over your head? <laughs> that, looks, that, that looks that looks like the uh, the uh, big screen equivalent of a lava lamp. <laughs> well, it, it, it is, and it's. Um, it was it was uh, uh, left material done by one of the uh, greatest liquid light they used to call them performers in the 60s, where they used uh, overhead projector and oil and stuff to create real time in concert lava lamp type things, and he released uh, like hours of footage of his in, into the uh, uh, public domain. So. Uh, Yep, now with green screen, I'm, the tool I'm using, if, if you want uh, a really fun tool to play with, it gives you sorts of options, uh, more open source OBS studio. So it's just an a LCD screen that you're playing the image on, right? No, uh, well, it's really funny. If I turn around and look, there's a piece of green uh, poster board stuck on my wall. So. Um, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> I can change. Yeah, I've got different scenes with different background things, so it's it's just uh, it's just green screen chroma key. Okay, got it. Looks pretty cool. Well, yeah, we uh, Keith is also the source of uh, of most of our public domain music. So o Open Research Institute actually has an album, and you can find it in our repository. And uh, thanks to a lot of his uh, 
electronic music work. We have uh, background music for, for many of our videos, uh, compliments of Keith, and I don't nag him enough to produce more. Um, and if, if anybody has any art or music or anything that they would, um, they would like to share um, and are comfortable with sharing creative work in that way, then uh, that has a home at Open Research Institute as well. All right, any, any other questions for, for me for today? Thank you for putting this together. Oh, sure. No, happy to. Uh, credit goes to Anshul. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your first name correctly, Anshul. Um, but thank you very much. He was the one that actually bluntly suggested that having uh, regular teleconferences would be great. We do most of our daily engineering work on our Slack account, and we do have an email um, reflector as well. It's usually for announcements, um, but the, the, it's easy to get used to uh, thinking that you regularly uh, communicate well uh, just using your your slack uh, but we will we will do these more often um, so that we can uh, reach more people and uh, and have in person conversations it's a fundamentally different experience to communicate with people on a phone or in person as close as you can get uh, in person uh, nowadays. Um, but yes, thank you very much to Anshul for providing the uh, activation energy for to get this up and running. Uh, and we should be going back to um, producing more videos on the YouTube channel. Uh, the reason that, that we uh, kind of dropped off in doing that is partly because the, the workload increased uh, here. Uh, whenever, when I got um, elected to the AMSAT uh, board of directors. So, which has been a remarkable experience, um, I, I have to say. Um, so that additional workload pretty much pushed the routine um, video production uh, to, the, to the pile of not quite done. Um, but fortunately, some other time is freed up. So we will go back to producing walkthroughs and um, uh, videos of demonstrated work uh, you know, highlighting things that we, we do. Um, so that will be a, another, another improvement going forward. Okay. Well, thank you everybody. Yeah. The, uh, the, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks Michelle, uh, for putting this forward. It has been really useful, like being new to the project. Now I understand the overall project and, uh, overall architecture and whom to reach out for specific areas like Scotty for FPGA and others. So yeah, it has been really helpful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it a lot. Okay, well, we made a recording and we'll, we'll post it too. Um, thank you very much for, for coming today and look for this to happen again um, in the future. We'll try to do this uh, get together uh, once a month and have a short presentation from someone on some sort of work and just, but to generally have as much time as needed for questions and answers of any type and uh, requests for assistance or help or clarification. That's, uh, that's gonna be permanently on the agenda. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah. Any last words? Everybody stay well. Yes, please stay well. And uh, you know, uh, reach out, email or phone or any, any way. And uh, here, just here to make it an uh, uh, easy process to get involved and to break down uh, any barriers. Thank you. 73 everyone. Uh, 73. Thank you, bet.